All right. Sorry about the momentary problem there in the video, unfortunately. This Welcome to CPI Para World, our first uh, broadcast we've done under the new name. Thank you for everyone who's tuning in. Uh, tonight, uh, things have changed a little bit. We're hoping Lori's able to join us. She had something happen, and uh, hopefully she's able to join us later on. Uh, tonight, we have our guest, Jack Carey. How you doing, Jack? I am wonderful. How are you? I'm doing great. And for those that uh, know me from my prior channel and show, Chad up there, my co-host. Okay. I'm glad uh, he's able to join us here tonight. And uh, if you can, again, it's our first broadcast. So if you're not already, please subscribe, share, and uh, like. It's all free. And that'll help us out. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you in advance. All right. Well, like I always do on my show, it's that time. Jack Carey. How you doing, Jack? I am wonderful. How are you? I'm doing great. And for those that uh, know me from my prior channel and show, Chad up there, my co-host. Okay. I'm glad uh, he's able to join us here tonight. And uh, if you can, again, it's our first broadcast. So if you're not already, please subscribe, share, and uh, like. It's all free. And that'll help us out. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you in advance. All right. Well, like I always do on my show, it's that time of the show. Grab your drinks. Regardless of what you have, whether it's alcoholic or not, doesn't matter. It's In this case, it's a Saturday night and a great show. Right. Yeah. Yep. Cheers. Cheers. Getting my caffeine. Cool. And I'm for those that are milk. new, it's it's not about getting drunk. We just drink a little bit as we go. Yeah. I only drink go through one can, so I'm not going to be very lit. Yeah, I've, been, right. I've been on a cosmic cantina before, and they they definitely get drunk during the interview. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not too big on doing that. I want to let everybody know. Also, I, I'm aware I have Larry back behind me there. Larry the alien. Nice. I need to exercise, so he just rubbed his decoration on the bike. But that's still very important. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Jack, can you tell us a little bit about what you do and everything? Yeah, I am a uh, thirty going on thirty year now paranormal investigator slash cryptozoologist. They kind of overlap one another in strange ways. A lot of the time and uh, uh, now I consider myself I've done paranormal research long enough and I've published four books now that I consider myself really an investigative journalist and I specialize in paranormal activity and events and creatures um, so really that's that's who I am I founded the Paranormal Intelligence Agency, which we have a website, parainteligency.com, which is below my face on there at some point. And um, that is our, our uh, primary presence on the web. Um, I publish special reports on there that I do from hundreds and hundreds of different sources. and. Um, have a YouTube channel just under Jack Carey. Uh, a lot of you may recognize me from um, my appearances on various Gaia uh, television series and documentaries. Um, and a lot of people seek me out just under Jack Carey's. That's why it's under Jack Carey and not the Paranormal Intelligence Agency on my YouTube. So come by and check that out. I've got 83 research videos. Um, each one is about a different kind of paranormal activity or a cryptid animal. And um, so, yeah, check that out. Well, that's awesome. Um, you, were on, you were on the air with me uh, at, a, at a prior location, and you told a couple great stories I told you just before we went on the air I'd love for you to tell. Um, one involved a place in New Mexico. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, they, they both occurred in New Mexico, and they were both, strangely enough, this was one very large paranormal event that all took place 
uh, really during the same case, which I've often contemplated about and trying to dissect and understand myself because I don't quite understand how and why these two different kinds of paranormal activity intersected with one another, except for now we have what's called the hitchhiker effect, which I can go into later. But um, this case is known, or was known, if you look it up on Google, as the ultra-terrestrial case. I assume there's still some, some articles about it. Um, I was partnered at the time with a man named J.C. Johnson, who was widely considered to be the best cryptozoologist at the time. This was a, the very first case we ever worked on together, and the reason why is because um, he had investigated cases on the Navajo Reservation before, and had actually at one point intermarried into the tribe, and this was happening to a Navajo, traditional Navajo family, which gave him an inroads to the Navajo Police Department who contacted him saying, you know, we've got a case of some weird stuff going on that you might want to investigate. And this case had paranormal aspects to it because it, it, it basically featured the UFO phenomenon and the alien abduction phenomenon. And he wasn't quite sure how to tackle it. And um, at the time, there was an article running in a um, New York magazine called Vocative that was all about my organization, um, the PIA, and it's called Inside the Mind of Paranormal Intelligence Agent. Um, article still out there today for anybody who wants to read it. And he had read that article and decided to get a hold of me because it talked about me being in Colorado and he was in northern New Mexico. And he got a hold of me on my website and asked me if I wanted to help him investigate this case. And I was there within 48 hours. And we went on to the property um, of this Navajo family who really suffered a truly traumatic event when they were recounting their tale to us, they broke down uh, emotionally and were were quite uh, were crying a lot and have found it very difficult to recount a lot of what had occurred to them. But they one night were sitting in their hogan, and every Navajo traditional Navajo family has what's called a hogan, which is an eight-sided structure that's outside of their main home. And it's a traditional religious structure where all of the family, like ceremonies and special events and stuff like that, are, are done. Um, beyond that, every Navajo family typically has a trailer of some kind on the property that's their main residence where they live and they typically have other family members that live on the same land or the same acreage, if you will, um, close to one another. And that was the case with this particular family. And one night they were in their Hogan and all of a sudden they began to hear machine gun fire way off in the distance. Very strange. In fact, they described it to one of the the younger males of the family described it as, um, as sounding like mini guns, if people know what those are, that you find on the side of helicopters and things like that. So it's almost like a Gatlin, a modern day Gatlin gun. Um, and all of a sudden, they began to see light pouring through the cracks because these hogans are made out of their mud hut hogans. And over time, the ceilings crack, and all of a sudden, light began to pour through all of the cracks onto the floor in the Hogan. And they began to hear this crazy, rumbling, staticky noise, and it really frightened them, and the whole Hogan began to shake. And they ran out of the Hogan only to see a UFO or a UAP, whatever you want to refer to it as these days, hovering above their property. 
and above the Hogan and the trailer and the rest of the property and was shining this hugely bright light down. And there were aliens literally on the ground running around. They ran into their trailer. The husband grabbed a weapon. They barricaded themselves and called the police. They could hear them running around on the ceiling. They could hear all kinds of stuff going on outside. We later found out that the uncle of the family lived on the property and in the panic of the moment began to run towards his trailer that was on the same acreage and ran right into one of these creatures, knocking it down onto the ground and him on top of it. And he literally instinctively, I suppose, began to strangle this thing to death. Now the couple that owned the property began to break down hysterically when they were telling us all of this. So um, they end up running into their trailer. They call the police. It was a long time later after they heard a lot more commotion outside that the police department actually ends up responding because this was a pretty remote property. And um, it takes a long time to get out there. It was, it, I was amazed at how long it took us. Um, and so they get out there and they're accompanied by a black SUV. And they could only describe the occupant of the black SUV as being a super soldier like. In fact, they called him, the only thing they could equate it to was um, that it was a, what was the movie, Universal Soldier, is how the male of the family put it. It was like this Universal Soldier-like guy gets out of this SUV and he's got guns all over him. They couldn't believe how many guns, like so they counted six, I believe is what they told us. Wow. And he, yeah, and he seemed to be in charge of the other cops that were on scene and he could hear this couple telling the police officer about the uncle running into this creature. And he looked over at the other trailer, gets in his SUV, drives over to that uncle's trailer, gets out, goes inside, and apparently retrieves something that he then brings outside and puts into the back of the SUV and drives off the property. Now, the police take the report. There was nothing else they could do. They left this family in complete hysterics. And that's when they contacted JC Johnson and JC contacted me. And we were there the day after that. Um, it was a one day delay. So we were there within 48 hours of actually this event taking place. Now, when we got there, the footprints from all of this activity was still all around their property, including a hundred tiny little footprints about like that. It was crazy. I couldn't believe it. I was just like beside myself in the emotion that these people were having, um, telling us this whole thing. And we decided that um, we were going to stick out the property for a couple of nights just to see if anything else was taking place. And the um, next day, they were planning on taking us out to this remote kind of a service road that's way on the edge of the reservation where they believed the gunfire was coming from. And there was like a, there's a railroad track out there that runs adjacent to all of this or runs basically through the reservation. And um, so we were like great we uh camped out in the hogan that night and the next day they um started to drive us out to this location and it was probably around noon i remember it being pretty hot because this was in the summertime this was probably early august in in new mexico so it was pretty hot and um we we're driving down this road for a really long time and we had two navajos the the uh that were driving one driving and the other in the uh, passenger seat and 
me and JC Johnson were in the rear of this little SUV and we're driving down the road and there's nothing and there's nobody. I mean, you talk about remote, you get out on some of these like Navajo Indian reservations and, and they are so remote, you can't believe it. Like you get out on some of those roads and they're, first of all, it takes you a major like SUV to even get down some of these roads. And even when you do, there's nothing but the occasional uh, sheep herder basically um and that's how this road was right it was just a dirt gravel in the middle of nowhere and it was adjacent to this railroad track and it's on reservation land and we're driving and driving and driving and we're miles out there and i'm just thinking to myself well i hope the car doesn't break down out here because you're going to be hurt you know (laughs) and way off yeah, you know, and way off in the distance, we see this figure walking, not down the road, but on the side of the road, you know. And I look over on the side of the road, and it's like, it's cactus and scroll brush and sharp, jagged rock. And, like, if you've ever been on now, on New Mexico land in that area of northern New Mexico, it's just... It's like uh, the worst kind of desert environment you can think of, just sharp thorns. I had like a, a thorn that big go through a, a, you know, a big work boot I was wearing, right? Oh, wow. So, I mean, there, it's that kind of environment. And so I thought it was odd that this person was walking on the side of the road just because it would be so hard to walk on the side of the road. And they're a ways away. It's not like we were getting close to where they just hopped off the side of the road. No, they were just strolling right along. And um, I thought, wow, well, this is going to be a sheep herder for sure. Navajo sheep herder. And we get closer and closer. Pretty soon we can tell that it's a female. And she's wearing this, what appears to be a jean dress. Like if people from the 1980s remember, like, guests used to have, like, jean dresses, you know, the, the you know, the labeled guests used to have those jean dresses that girls used to wear and stuff. And, um, and so she's wearing this jean dress, if we can tell that. And I'm just, like, kind of in shock. And I think we were all in kind of shocked that this girl was out in the middle of nowhere, you know, and we're getting closer and closer. And she puts her head down like this, and she's just standing on the side of the road, and we get pulled right up next to her. And I look down at her feet because uh, I had a mother that was obsessed with shoes, Right. And I look down to see what she's wearing because she's walking off in this jagged, like rocky area. And she has six inch cork high heels. Wow. She's strolling through some six inch open toe cork high heels. Wow. And the dress is like tattered and torn and everything. And JC's already has his window rolled down. Like he's rolling it down right away because we're just thinking, oh my God, this girl's going to die. She's going to die out here because if somebody doesn't help her, she must have broken down somewhere or something like that. Something was going on, you know, somebody abandoned her. (laughs) (laughs) All all these things like rushed through your head at the time because you just can't believe it, you know. And she's got her head down and her hair is down and everything and it's kind of short cropped. Um, and JC immediately out of his mouth, cause he was such a gentleman. He'd give the shirt off his back. He was like, ma'am, are you okay? Can we help you? And she looked up at us and her eyes were completely, totally, utterly black. There was no white. And wow. she gave us, you know, and she gave us the most evil grin you've ever seen in your life. Um, it was truly like just a, a maniacal kind of a grin and she goes and i'll never forget it she goes i got everything i need and just smiled at us in this like really evil way and right when she said those words man it hit us like a ton of bricks it was crazy like we both started basically vomiting um jc completely short-circuited his brain the navajo just punched the gas and spread rock and everything else 
and just started you know, zooming down the road and a couple of miles down the road, I'm just like, you got to stop. I got to get out and get some air because I was just dying. I couldn't catch my breath. And I get out and I, I'm just, I'm bent over on my knees, basically like, you know, got my hands on my knees and I'm bent over and um, I puked and I swear to God, I look up and that girl is down the road walking towards us in an impossibly fast distance, impossibly, just couldn't be. I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. And that totally freaked us out. And we got back into the, the SUV and went back to the property and they had to call like a Navajo holy man you know to come and bless the whole like family and do the, all of this stuff because they thought it was a you know a desert demon or something like that that we came across it was later that people began to report the bek phenomenon and the idea that uh, all over the country people were experiencing younger um, people with fully black eyes blacked out eyes and they call them the black eyed kids so uh, what do you think the black eyed kids are? You know, I've often wondered that myself. You know, at the time, it was my impression, like me and JC's impression, that this was like a horribly demonically possessed human being. That was the other thing was that like, when she looked up at us, her, her like makeup and the way she was made up with her hair and everything looked like she had come out of a beauty salon. Like it was perfect. All of that wow. was perfect. But the jean dress was like tattered and torn and like dirty and stuff. It was just freaky, man. I don't know how to explain it. But what was weird was that we felt like we were really on to something with the ultra terrestrial case that we were going to make a breakthrough because we knew the uncle was the key to the case. And the fact was is that the uncle mysteriously came up with a huge sum of money that could he couldn't explain to the rest of the family. If anybody knows Navajo reservations, they're they're pretty stark. It's pretty harsh living, and um, for somebody to come up with a, enough money basically to buy a brand new trailer and a brand new truck, and wouldn't speak about the event ever after that told us that he was probably paid off to keep his mouth shut because of what happened. And we believe that what that guy took out of his trailer that night was an alien body. Oh, um, wow. Uh, the same alien body that the uncle had strangled to death. That's what we think. And the young couple recounted to us how they heard the screams of the alien off in the distance outside the trailer as he was strangling us to death. It's just crazy. And then it occurred to us later on that all of a sudden this figure appears during the investigation. And we're going to target the uncle and everything. And it knocks the investigation into a completely, it just derailed the entire thing because we both got so sick, we just couldn't even continue. Um, I was sick for a week. The sickest I've ever been when I got back to Colorado and I had to literally drag myself from the bed to the toilet to, to vomit this black fluid um, and back again for a full week. And I just thought I was going to die. And JC was never the same again. He was famous for his sense of direction and, um, and for his just overall health. And he was never the same. His health began to fade, you know, shortly after that, he lost all sense of direction. So, yeah, it was, it was a, a truly life-changing paranormal event. Well, that is, that is really something. Uh, what, what all do you investigate as well? You know, I've investigated pretty much every kind of paranormal activity there is. I wrote a book about my unified field theory of paranormal activity, and it's called Paranormal Planet, for those of you who are interested in the actual scientific theory behind how and why paranormal events take place. 
And in my investigations, I discovered, I, I began to suspect because of so-called vortex areas, places where there's a wide array of paranormal activity all taking place in a small geographic area, that there had to be a singular source for paranormal activity. And what I found was there was actually a dual source of paranormal activity. One of those sources is what I call interaction with a type three society that covers most of the physical UFO type activity. I believe a type three society is a type three society on the so-called Kardashev scale. Um, for those that are familiar with the Kardashev scale, it's an easy way to tell how advanced a civilization is by how much power it consumed. And he believed that there were three tiers to society, type one, a type two, and a type three. A type three is so advanced, so powerful that they can harness the power off of entire stars, um, starting with their own. And they can therefore power all kinds of artificial intelligence and things like that. And I believe that the earth is actually a target for a type three civilization that is so old, so advanced, so archaic in nature that it's maybe billions of years old, that it goes out and seeds entire planetary systems at a time with life forms only to come back later on and farm those life forms into its own civilization when they become advanced enough. And I think that there's an argument to be made that most of the UFO activity has to do with monitoring our environment. Um, and if you had planetary systems seeded with life forms, you would probably want to monitor everything, even down to the molecular level, especially their food sources. And I think that that's exactly what's happening with the so-called explained animal death phenomenon or the cattle mutilation phenomenon was that the food supply became contaminated and these artificially intelligent craft coming from who knows how far off in space, maybe even the center of the galaxy, are here and they are testing our food supply down to that level. Um, all of the organs that are gone are the highest cell reproduction uh, organs and the bodies, and that can tell you more than any advance um, that what's happening with the food supply. And so, this is the other type is interdimensional in nature, and I, it's, it's what I believe is happening. With we have a question here about what's happening at Skinwalker Ranch, and what I think about it, and really, Skinwalker Ranch is has revolutionized paranormal research. And that, that didn't happen at the ranch itself. It happened when most of the chief scientists from Skinwalker Ranch were hired by the Pentagon. And there's a book out there called Skinwalkers at the Pentagon um, that I highly encourage everybody to read. Everybody's read Skinwalker Don, or, uh, uh, Skinwalker Ranch, but this Skinwalker is Pentagon tells you the full story of what happened after all of that. And what ends up happening is that all of those chief scientists that were also embedded within intelligence communities, let's face it, Travis Taylor, the chief scientist at Skinwalker Ranch, was a CIA scientist forever, and, um, and was in the CIA while he was at Skinwalker Ranch. Well, they had a lot of those guys that you don't see on camera and stuff like that that have visited Skinwalker Ranch numerous times at the behest of Robert Bigelow and the, the new owner, um, Brandon Fugel. And these guys are the same guy. And I'm talking about like Dr. Gary Nolan and Dr. Colm Kelleher in, in particular are the same guys that were hired by the Pentagon to run the so-called OSAP program. Now, the OSAP program was part of the overall UFO program, but it was tasked with only studying the paranormal aspects of UFO phenomenon. Think about that. There were so many paranormal things happening when they were studying the UFO phenomenon that didn't seem related to the UFO phenomenon, that they had to start a new task force just to study those things. And wow. they make 
Yeah, right. And they make the statement in uh, their report to Congress that until they can understand the underlying paranormal aspects of the overall UFO phenomenon, they'll never be able to understand the, the totality of the phenomenon itself. That's a huge statement coming from who doc, Dr. Gary Nolan, who most people in the scientific community believe is the best scientist on the planet. Um, that's a huge statement. And here's what was happening. So all of these guys, and this culminates in a dogman sighting. So this is where things get really freaky, right? So all of these people that are associated with Skinwalker Ranch and later on with the Pentagon's OSAP program and the people that are in the ATIP program, which studied the UFOs themselves, and now the Aero program, which is what it's called, all of them to a 100% degree, think about that, not one person escaped, were in their day job studying the UFO phenomenon only to go home at night and experience a wide array of other kinds of paranormal activity. And I'm talking about like everything from poltergeist activity to black uh, entities walking across shadow people, walking across their bedrooms at night to orbs manifesting and zooming through their house to material objects manifesting and dematerializing right in front of them. Oh, wow. All of this began to happen. And here's where things get really weird, right? So not only does it begin to happen to them, but it begins to happen to their family members and then their family members' friends and then their neighbors and their neighbors' kids. And they began to plot these things and it began to slowly move out in concentric circles like a virus. Just wow. like a virus. And they called it the paranormal virus for a reason because they didn't know what else to call it, right? Mm -hmm. So, But it kind of dissipates as it goes, just like a virus. It's just the most bizarre thing, right? Well, the chief scientist, or not scientist, but the, the, the guy that was the... Uh, highest ranking intelligence official to go out to Skinwalker Ranch. And he goes by the code name Axelrod, which is fascinating because there's a history of CIA agents using the last name Axelrod as, as identity covers. But he goes by the, the last name Axelrod in the book. Um, is there one night with some other intelligence agents and some scientists, and they come across what they believe to be, have been uh, an invisible but malicious type of entity on the ranch itself. Um, they describe actually being able to see it with night vision, but unable to see it with the naked eye. This thing like put pure fear into them and they literally had to retreat. Well, a thousand miles away, while this guy is on Skinwalker Ranch. His wife, who lives in Virginia, near the CIA headquarters, is in her home one night, and she goes over to the sink really late at night to pour a glass of water, and she looks out her window, and she sees across the property standing next to a tree, and as she described it, an upright, dog-headed creature on two legs. Oh, wow. And it was standing next to the tree, staring at her with these glowing eyes. And she thinks she's losing her mind. The lady had never heard of a dog man before. You know, it didn't even cross her mind. You know, she literally thought she was just losing her mind. And so she doesn't say anything to the rest of the family or to anybody else. She gets her water and she goes to bed and she's frightened and everything. The, that following Saturday morning, and this was on a Wednesday night, the following Saturday morning, 10 a.m., bright daylight outside, the two teenagers are in the game room of the house, and they see, they see movement out of the corner of their eye. They look over at the window, and this creature is staring in at a dog man, staring right there through the glass, right at them in broad daylight. It 
they should have been frightened to death, but instead they ran towards the window because they couldn't believe what they were seeing. They thought it had to be a hoax or something. I this can thing, see that. That's easy to see. Yeah, and this thing takes off running, and they look through the window, and they can see it kicking up leaves behind it as it went. So you're talking about a physical creature literally kicking up leaves as it went and ran off into the woods. So what are we, as a cryptozoologist, you can see the problem running into here, right? Here's a group of the world's best scientists who have now identified what they are calling the hitchhiker effect. And the hitchhiker effect is all of this side paranormal stuff that happens when you began to study the UFO phenomenon and you take it home with you. And this results, not only does the hitchhiker res effect result in cryptozoological encounters at Skinwalker Ranch, but it results in a dogman encounter a thousand miles from Skinwalker Ranch. Wow. And they, they equate this dogman encounter as part of the hitchhiker effect. Wow. So where do we as cryptozoologists begin to draw the line of where the hitchhiker effect ends and other living, breathing beings in the crypto world exist? You see what I mean? It's a very difficult thing. Oh, my. Yeah. Uh... Mm. Yeah, those are some really good stories. Uh, any other good stories? About, go ahead. Go, what you say, I was going to ask you about Skinwalker Ranch. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so I saw that on the on the window, and I was like, yeah, it's Skinwalker Ranch ties into all of this. And the fact that they keep going back to the Mesa and the yeah. fact that there appears to be something buried in the Mesa Um may end up leading us to an ultimate conclusion as to what the hitchhiker effect is, because we don't really know how far the hitchhiker effect goes. Well, I can tell you this. So Jacques Vallée, the famous ufologist Jacques Vallée, wrote a book about the Trinity crash. And the Trinity crash, and it's, a, it, it's relatively new. It came out in the last couple of years. The Trinity crash predates Roswell. And um, it was at another nuclear test site, um, which is very interesting because these things always crash near nuclear test sites. I think there's a reason for that. But the people at Trinity, the nearest town to Trinity, and the people that were in Roswell at the time that these crashes occurred, all reported a wave of paranormal activity occurring throughout the town. At the wow. time, it seemed completely unrelated. At the time, and the ufologists pay no attention to it, but Jacques Vallée paid attention to it because if you know his work, you you know how he's tied UFOs to like all kinds of world mythologies and things like that. And here you have um, him basically finding articles of people reporting little devils and things like that running through the town at the time of the Roswell. Um, encounter ghost activity, all kinds of stuff. It's fascinating. But um, how far back does it go? We don't really know. We know he's been able to trace it at least that far back. And we know that here's another little known uh, uh, encounter that most people don't, won't realize that also shows the hitchhiker effect is Kenneth Arnold. So Kenneth Arnold, who most people will know is being the guy who you know, described the nine craft as skipping like saucers over water, and that's where flying saucer came from, from a, a news reporter who heard him say that. Um, he had blue orbs flying through his home shortly after that. Oh, wow. Reported by his daughter, um, which is just insane. So what is this hitchhiker effect, and how far does it go back? I don't know. But I, to me, I think that that is the cutting edge of paranormal research today is studying the hitchhiker effect because it was recognized by these world-class scientists who are clearly have nothing to hide and have published all of this material. If you look through podcasts for Dr. Gary Nolan, you're going to have him 
you can hear it in his own words, tell all of this information, uh, or Dr. Colm Kelleher. Uh, go to Theories of Everything podcast and look up Dr. Gary Nolan, and he's done a number of interviews um, that are multi-hour interviews, so you get the full accounting of what happened. But I highly recommend the book, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. No. Was the, oh. No, go ahead. Oh, the, the stuff you said that occurred to people that were in Skinwalker Ranch, was that under the prior ownership to uh, to oh, uh, Brendan Frogel? I, I got the name wrong. I forgot this would be. I lost yeah, the name, Brent, sorry. That's all right. Brandon Fugel is his name, but he um, this happened when Bigelow was the owner. Um, but they've had all kinds of weird stuff happen with Fugel as the owner, too. I think it's amazing that every time they launch a rocket in a particular area, you get a UFO-like response. That's it's fascinating to me. It's almost like they're guarding that area for some reason. Right. It makes me wonder what's buried there that they have to guard it. Is there an alien consciousness somehow buried there? Most people don't realize this, and I've got a screen capture from it. And they did publish it on their website at one point. But they walked into, or the, the guy that, that watches all of the cameras was watching the cameras one night in the computer room. And all of a sudden, one of the screens began to flicker. And these words popped up on the screen, and the words were, I live. How weird is that? That just put wow. chills down my spine when I saw it. And, and yeah, and the way that it's, you know, the letters look and everything on the screen are just totally bizarre. And you're thinking to yourself, well, what are we really looking at here? Is this like some sort of are we looking at the Tommy knocker effect? In other words, if you know Stephen King's book, The Tommy Knockers, where there's a buried alien craft and the it's basically like the spirit of the aliens that have possessed people who are having all these special abilities take place, you know. All kinds of theories run through your mind when you're entertaining, you know, the hitchhiker effect. Oh, definitely. Well, that's really something. Yeah. Um, I know you've you've written a book or two. Do you do you mind? Do you want to go ahead and push promote one for a little bit here? Oh, sure. Um, I've got four out there. You can find them all in under Amazon under Jack Carey. Uh, I wrote a book called American Sorcerer, which is advanced remote viewing techniques. Not that I'm a master remote viewer, but what I was able to do was mine out all of their remote uh, viewing controls and protocols that were actually developed by the Stargate program over decades of time. And they spent hundreds of millions of dollars to ensure what they were experiencing was psychic ability and not something that just simply appeared to be psychic ability. And they did that by eliminating cross-contamination uh, between the target and the targeter, um, which is fascinating. I, I wrote a book about that, and it's called American Forcer. Um, I wrote a book called Paranormal Planet, and that is the book I discussed previously that has my unified field theory of paranormal activity in it along with some actual field cases that, uh, that the Paranormal Intelligence Agency has done. Um, I wrote a book called Bigfoot Unleashed, which is all about the Bigfoot mystery and um, basically shows that there's a whole side to the Bigfoot mystery that is far more paranormal than most people presuppose. Um, and I talk about all of that um, and the DNA that we actually collected in the field that went into the Sasquatch Chief Project. Um, and then I wrote a my latest book, which is The Enoch Code, and that's um, a 382-page book that I wrote all dealing with the mystery of Renle Chateau and the basically the mystery of Enoch himself, his interaction with what he described as being fallen angels and how that led to the entire like French occult revival. So it's it's a uh, interesting book because it traces the Enoch code all the way from ancient times and the Book of Enoch all the way to modern day. 
occult groups that are still using. All right. Well, I think uh, that's about all I have, I think. Do you have anything else to add by chance, Jack? I don't. Uh, come by and see us at parantilagency.com. Um, there's always new stuff going up all the time, and uh, I've got articles on there about the hitchhiker effect and um, some exclusive videos. So. All right. I got. Uh, I have your information scrolling across the screen again. Cool. I did it uh, periodically throughout, so that way uh, people can catch it whenever. We'll yeah. Let it finish here. Um, it's Chad, just, do you think to add? Go ahead. I was just going to say it's just paraintelagency.com, not intelligence agency. Oh, so. paraintel. I'm sorry. That's all right. I had to shorten it. I'm sorry. It's long for people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a lot of letters because uh, I do it central Pennsylvania for me. That's also a lot of letters um, <laughs> for people to type in. And uh, yeah, I can see that. Paraintelagency.com. Yeah. So. All right. Well, and uh, Chad, do you have anything to add by chance? No, he pretty much answered my question about Skinwalker Ranch. Awesome. Yeah, that's something that really intrigued me. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, so when you guys are out there investigating and you're investigating cryptozoological stuff or whatever, pay attention to the other stuff that's going on around you because even Bigfoot investigators, even the most hardened ones, have reported to us seeing orbs of light and UFO type of activity um, at the same time that they experience Bigfoot activity. So it was Jonathan Keel who actually found out that 20% of all credible Bigfoot sightings also report a UFO at the scene. Wow. Well, that is pretty high. Yeah, that's a big number of people. Yeah. What do you think of Bigfoot? Well, you know, I'm on the fence because there there is this paranormal aspect to the mystery, but at the same time, they just seem so darn flesh and blood all the time. And my experience in the field, I would have to say flesh and blood because I never experienced anything that was paranormal along with the mystery itself. Um, and I saw one once. It was undeniable. I mean, this thing was clearly a, a Sasquatch. And it, to me, they represent a, a, an archaic kind of people that are living in the wilds of North America. I don't believe that there's some dumb great ape. I think they have a language. I think they have a culture. I think they do something with their dead, which is why we, do, we don't find bodies. And whether that's consuming them as a form of ancient, uh, you know, ancestor worship, which is done in a lot of primitive cultures, or whether they bury their dead, which is what a Native American eyewitness told us at one point, um, they do something with them. And that's religion. That's culture. So we're looking at something that has a human-like intelligence, something that we, along with Robert Kreider, um, one of the best Bigfoot guys out there, basically clocked one running 70 miles an hour over uneven terrain. Wow. I'm talking about a creature that can run cheetah-like speed in mountainous terrain. It can see you from a mile away. It can smell you from two miles away. It travels in small family units. Yeah, and it's got 93 million uninhabited acres to roam in. So, yeah, a creature like that can and does stay hidden. Right. So. It's a lot of land to hide, even though there's a lot of places where there are people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's thousands upon thousands of credible Bigfoot sightings. We know that they're there. The disappearing track lines to me, I talk about, I think that that's evidence not of them disappearing into another dimension, but our DNA that went into the Sasquatch Genome Project showed that the mitochondrial side, which is the, the, the maternal lineage of the creature, is modern human. Okay. That's just the way it is. Dates back about 15,000 years. The paternal side DNA came back unknown primate. 
So you're talking about a time in human history when a lot of ancient cultures talked about how there was an alien presence on the planet and there was a lot of genetic experimentation and stuff like that going on. Could very well be that either they are the original inhabitants of the planet or they were experiment. There was some sort of experimentation that took place, a fusion of genes, a chimera, as I argue in Bigfoot Unleashed, that these are in fact a chimera creature. We are creating chimeras here on the earth right now. There's no reason why a more intelligent species couldn't have created a chimera between human humans and a, a type of primate that was alive on the planet at the time, which could describe why they're so human-like. Um, all we know is what the DNA tells us, and we know what all of the reports of the patterns that they tell us. But here's a fascinating point about the Bigfoot phenomenon that most researchers don't like to talk about is that you can take the missing 411 person case and all the national park system, which most people are familiar with missing 411 today, I hope, and the, th the thousands of people that have gone missing in the national park system who vanished without a trace. And you can lay a Bigfoot sighting map right on top of it. And I mean, just flat on top of it. And they are a spot on match. And then yeah, and then you can take a map of all the known cave systems in North America and lay that on top of the other two, and they're a spot-on match. Okay. And we have a saying at the PIA, which is, once is chance, twice is coincidence, three times is a pattern, and a pattern always denotes intelligence. And so I have to say that is an uncanny coincidence if there's not some sort of causal relationship between them. So that's all I know right now about the Bigfoot mystery. I, but I'm just saying I'm beginning to try to look into some of the more paranormal aspects, for instance. Like even Bobo, like from, you know, the uh, Finding Bigfoot team or whatever, um, was on a interview with David Paulides of Missing 411. And he described seeing balls of light at the same time he had a Bigfoot sighting. So you're talking about, you know, very strange aspects of the mystery. Oh, Definitely. Any idea what would be happening to these people if they run across Bigfoot? The 411 cases run across Bigfoot by chance? Yeah, um, that I don't is know. Is Bigfoot killing them? You know, predation is a major um, possible cause. And, you know, I produced a, a video and it's called Bigfoot in the Missing. And this was after an exhaustive examination of every single missing 411 case all of them that were published. There's also some films out there for people who don't like to read that are, are fascinating films about the books. So in, in all of these missing 411 cases, there was a pattern that was discovered. Well, two patterns. One of the major patterns is called the berry picker cluster. So in an, in an inordinate percentage of the cases where people went missing, they went missing after they went into the wilderness to pick wild berries. Now, this is always just by happenstance in the spring, right? And that's when the berries are in bloom. And there was one of those cases that really caught my attention because out of all of the hundreds of cases that are out there, it's the only case where somebody hears a scream or in this case, a partial scream from the person who goes missing. And in this particular case, we're talking about a mother and a father who had a young son. The young son was on the other side of a small copse of trees. They're all picking berries. They hear him scream partially and then something muffle the scream. I argue wow. the only thing that can muffle the scream like that, well, there's two things. One of them, the kid drop through an interventional doorway of some kind, you know, just opens up in the wilderness. And I make the case for that in my book, Paranormal Planet, that it's possible doorways just open up and people vanish that way. Or it was a hand 
that muffled the scream. Do you think if if, I'm, if a doorway had opened right in front of me, would I happen to be able to tell there's a doorway? Or would I just walk through it? Like, or you like just walk through it. I think you just walk through it. Otherwise, I think people would, would avoid them. And you just, all of a sudden, you just pop into another dimension where who knows what could be there. You know what I mean? Like it's just sure. most horrific, most horrific ending you could ever imagine. Or you get taken by a Sasquatch for whatever reason. And we've got many oral histories from Native Americans telling us that they used to steal children. Well, how many of these cases are children that go missing? A huge number of them. And I would argue that that was a hand is the highest probability and that people are being seen as competition for natural resources when they're out picking wild berries in the springtime, which is the same time the Bigfoot come down from higher elevation to actually pick berries. And I think that that's what you're seeing there. The other really crazy pattern of all of these missing people is the fact that there's a lunar cycle involved. They discovered that in almost every single case, the people disappear at either the point where the moon is at its brightest point or the point where the moon is at its darkest point. Hmm. Even though some of them go missing in the daylight, it doesn't really matter. It's they, they determined that from the lunar cycles that that was in fact one of the patterns. And I discovered in my cryptozoology studies that there are a number of science papers out there from biologists who have linked pre predatory behavior to lunar cycles. Okay, wow. Well, that's going to end our uh, broadcast tonight. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you don't mind, we're just starting out. So if you could give us, help us out greatly, it would be a great deal. It's free. Yeah, feel free to like, subscribe, and share. Everything we do would be awesome. Help us out a great deal. Um, and that's about.